Last night, the much anticipated documentary, Scars of the Revolution, was aired. It unravels atrocities before and during the June 4 uprising, led by then junior rank in the military, Flight Lieutenant Jerry John Rawlings. Now, Ghanaians embarked on a traumatic and divisive journey into their troubled past from 2002 when the National Reconciliation Commission began investigating the bloody secrets of dictatorial, unconstitutional regimes. We have a conversation on the back of this as we host Captain Budu Kumsin and Aloga Akatapori. Before that conversation begins, watch this. Can any Ghanaian seriously convince me that Jerry Rollins, the apostle of probity, accountability, and transparency, can today stand the test of those principles? It was an attempt to contain the possibility of an explosion, okay? Because um, it was a military regime and uh, we had tasted every aspect of government, socialism, capitalism, one-party state, multi-party state, coups, etc. None of these regimes were accountable to the people. Finally, we ended up with a situation where we had lost faith, the masses had lost faith in civilian democratic government. The masses had lost faith in the military government generals who used to rescue us once in a while. They, they were also becoming as corrupt as whatever it is. So in effect, what we ended up with, that the, the country had grown disillusioned with civilian elected governments and everything. The country had grown disillusioned with generals who came to save us. And now the situation was ready for the possibility of an explosion. French Revolution, Russian Revolution, any revolution you've read about, it was a reality in my country. And it was dangerous because very often in some parts of the world, let's say in my part of the world, for instance, it is not the medium of education, the medium of respect, of merit that is used to govern people, but they use the medium of fear to terrorize the people into a state of subjugation. When you use fear, it degenerates into hatred, and hatred can blow up. So the country was on the, on the verge of blowing up. And not that I disrespect the corporals and the sergeants and the lance corporals, but the point is that they were on the verge of now taking over power because the senior officers could not rescue the country. And quite frankly, had they done so, they would have butchered most of the officers because they saw the officers as part of whatever it was. So I want you to understand, we were running through dangerous times by 1979. So in moving in the first time, it was not a coup d'etat. I was trying to prevent a, vo a revolt, a mutiny, a revolution, a violent revolution. I tried to be as modest as I could to prevent it, and I ended up being arrested on the 15th of May, 1979. The very thing I was trying to prevent in 1979, a few weeks later, June 4th, 1979, from 15th May, 1979, to June 4th, the country just exploded. And it took us almost, th the country was just craving and calling for blood. Three former heads of state, six or five generals had to be executed to appease the bloodlust of the country. We had to, the military had to pay the price for it in order to prevent, you know, an escalation on the civil front. The civil front was equally angry, but we had to use the military to contain them and to pay the price with the military. So besides we, we had um, a multi-party democracy, what you call it, election in process within three months, and we couldn't stop it. We had to let it happen. So within three months after the revolt, we were able to hand over and we withdrew back to barracks, okay? But 
The difference is that in withdrawing back to barracks, corporals, sergeants, officers have tasted freedom, have tasted justice, have tasted political, political justice. What a country must be like. So when we withdrew back to barracks, there was a way in which the civilian, the new civilian politicians had lost. They, they had become oblivious to what took place. They had lost track of what took place. So they started misbehaving again. And this time, when people taste freedom, you cannot take it away from them again. So it was as if, uh-uh, this is not what we asked for. So they were getting ready to move back again. And I had the responsibility of taking that because I was seen as the hero type of thing. If I didn't, I would be indicted. If I didn't, somebody else angrier, very angry, would take it and it would be very disastrous. And assassination attempts on me, etc., the corruption by the government, the foolishness, etc. We had no choice but to step in. The event of June 4th did not only remove the military government of the day, it also culminated in the killing of the army commander at the time, Major General Odati Wellington, who had earlier addressed the nation at the Ghana Broadcasting Corporation, GBC, calling for the mutinous soldiers to return to the barracks. Fellow countrymen, I have come to the studio once again, this time to make a special appeal to all members of the armed forces. I urge all ranks who are armed to cease firing forthwith. I also urge Flight Lieutenant Rollins and any following whom he has with him to meet me at headquarters, 1st Infantry Brigade. Right. Um, chilling moment. I don't know if you were as um, horrified as I was when I was listening, when I was watching the documentary last night. The man in studio with us lived through some of these um, <coughs> harrowing events, Captain Retired Buda Kumsen. Thanks for joining us, sir. Thank you for having me. Uh, how did you find this documentary? Uh, I watched it yesterday, and um, I was very quiet for a long time because I had heard a lot of those stories. Up until 81, I saw some, um, and then those we heard about, seeing it graphically being depicted, and it, I was saddened and made me angry also at the same time, and apprehensive about people romanticizing military governments or downplaying threats of military takeovers. Because um, you will have all these perpetrators come up with romantic ideas about how they want to help and this. But the reality, what I saw and I'm seeing, is that they will come in with these platitudes and can't even control the events mm. that come in the trail of it mm. or condone it because they can't control it and then try to justify somehow later on. And, and it, it was telling, it was telling. And um, there are so many people who are still hurting. Ordinary soldiers who were just dispatched, take him away, kill him. And the, 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 the friends, the families, the children, they are alive and these things have not been addressed. And I think the state has still failed a lot of people and it, the issue has to be addressed. How? I came away from this um, documentary by thinking that the national reconciliation effort was an uncompleted business. Mm. In what sense? I don't think a lot of people had a chance even to vent, articulate what happened to them. And it was obvious that uh, a lot of the heinous perpetrators are still walking free. Still walking free. The, um, 
You see, the Germans, after the Second World War, there's an institute, I think there's Simon Wiesenthal Center, mm -hmm. chasing down the perpetrators, really documenting what happened and dealing with it. And that is how you get to the root of it, something to unearth. It's painful. It's a cathartic. It has to come. They say let bygones be bygones. Yeah, but that is us. J. Monka, that is our attitude. You see, so therefore, evil thrives under the cloak of anonymity. That is how I see things. Evil thrives when it is not unearthed and confronted. And so they are still around. So you feel these people should be made to face the law? They can be made to face the public. Then we can even pardon them. We can pardon them. But for them to run around, I call prance around, after they've committed such heinous crimes, with impunity, uh, it hurts. I lived through it, and I've heard people's stories. There are some friends I've never seen again. I don't know where they are. Like who? Ah, uh, no. I, 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 it's, 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 I remember the, I think, one of uh, the, the intelligence officer in one brigade I took over from, I think one or say something. I've never seen him again. I've never heard about him again. Is he alive? Is he dead? Do you miss him? Yeah, sure. Sometimes you remember. Then you wonder. You want closure. You understand? Who you are, are these closure. people who are prancing about? <laughs> well, you heard some names being mentioned. Whatever happened to them? Which names? <laughs> well, at least for the first time I heard from Captain Opoku yesterday. Who killed Janot Ati Walentin? And for me, he was my mentor. He was my hero. Although I confronted him on occasion, he was somebody I used to follow. I would follow him around because I liked him. He's, we, he, we called him Susu. He was a soldier, soldier. And we prided ourselves I could walk and talk like all that. Just behave like him because we loved him. You know. And somebody killed my hero. I didn't know who did it. But today, or now I know. You know. And uh, for me, well, it's good somehow. You know. And I know some of these so-called heroes who I can tell you point blank that they were cowards. One is red light. Mm. That's a coward. But then they became, they became heroes. You know, that's the guy who we were supposed to go and carry the colors at the airport on June, uh, well, no, the day I, or, our champion was overthrown. Mm -hmm. And he knew we would be taken. He complained and cried so much on the way that my sergeant, platoon sergeant, Sergeant Apiok, where is he? I don't know where he is. Sergeant Dropon, where is he? I don't know where he is. We were in the car. We, we put him out because he was crying. Now I hear he became a hero. He was, a, he was the forces arrest him. That's a coward. And if I tell you the story of the morning of 1st January, that the 81 coup. Yeah. How I confronted Red Light at the quarter guard of five battalions. Oh, he lied about everything. For the everything. sake of our, our listeners who may not know who he is, Red Light is? Uh, w, w, the forces, uh, the, the forces, uh, RSM, uh, Frimpong. Go ahead. So you on know, the 1st of January, you confronted him? I, he, these are guys who were opportunists. They would be on both sides of the fence judging where the pendulum was, and they will, they will sacrifice you to get to where they want to get to. Luckily for me, I came to Ghana. I saw him before he died. I met him at 37, and I refused to shake his hand. And I told him, to his face, if he dies a normal death, it will hurt me. God forgive me. You know, so we are all hurting. We have funny things. Look, I had to undergo psychological therapy in Germany for almost two years. Wow. Because I was suicidal at a point in time. You understand? But God is good. I'm stable now, and I'm working a normal life. You How understand? You, I mean, okay, so, so you did this for, for two years, but be, beyond the therapy, how do you deal 
like every day with what you saw and some of the things you did? I don't understand the question. How do you deal, like, how do you cope with the events that you, you saw? I mean, so many years down the line. <sighs> Nightmarish sometimes. But these days, the nightmares are all gone. You know, so um, you come to, God is a very, very interesting human thing, a person, you know, he, he heals you. Somehow, we've stabilized. You see some of those guys who actually ditched you, um, who betrayed you in your mind, who are on the other side, and we are now old, and we are all walking around Accra, and you see them, and you, 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 you just carry on. You just carry on. You don't I mean, feel bitter towards them anymore? Oh, no, no, I've gotten over it. I've gotten over it. But I, I have disdain, disdain for them. And um, I, I, no respect, whether you are a general general or what. They, we know ourselves. I know your, what substance you are made of. You understand? Including former President Rollins? Ah, uh, yeah. I mean, we know ourselves. Funny thing is that Rollins and myself, we are still friends. Mm. <laughs> we are still friends, yeah. In spite of all these atrocities that you saw? We are able to... He appreciates where I'm coming from. And I also appreciate where he's coming from. And uh, we respect each other as soldiers. Where he knows that I won't chicken out if there's something should happen. Tell us about when you had to drive General Echampo and General Utuka to the firing squad that morning. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the first time I'm being asked this thing in public. Well, after June 4th, after the fighting subsided, I was still at Air Force Base. And then uh, the started, units started arresting their officers and killing them. And, uh, uh, rebellion. I mean, there was general disorder. Meanwhile, the AFRC, is it, is it the AFRC? Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, June 4th, yeah? Yes. They yeah. the, 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 the headquartered in Arakan, 5 Battalion. And I was adjutant 5 Battalion, and I have fought against my own unit. So I was now <laughs> hiding out at Air Force Base. But then when they started arresting the, 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 the officers in the units, I think someone told them that, look, bring back that adjutant uh, and uh, Kwasi, and then let, we have to stabilize 5th Battalion. Others, because if they arrested the officer corps in 5th Battalion, the whole regime will come down. So I came back, and I was made to assume my post again in 5th Battalion. Mm. Even I, though you have fought against them. Yeah, but I've, it's not I fought against them because I hated them. But it was on principle. We fought. Mm. You were defending that, the that, Yes, okay. and that was, I was defending the government at that time, mm. in my mind. You know, I was young and naive and I gung-ho, I wanted to do what is right according to the book. So we all got back to 5 Battalion and we were able to stabilize 5 Battalion. The officer corps in 5 Battalion was very, very tight. Mm. Very, we had that esprit de corps because we have always been under a lot of pressure, so we, we got together. We decided that we will stay with the boys in their barracks day and night, 24 7. You won't go and sleep in the mess and leave them in the office for them to plan against you. So we stayed with them. So we stabilized 5th Battalion. We were there one morning at dawn. We used to hear a lot of things, you know, the general disorder. And then one dawn, specific to this question, around about 4.30ish, 5 a.m., flying, flying officer Odoi drove to my office, saluted, good morning, sir. I said, good morning. I said, you are wanted at Air Force Base. So Air Force Base at 5 o'clock in the morning? What for? And it, it rings a bell immediately. It's dangerous. Those days, if you are called at ungodly hours, something could happen. And all the time, I was a bit suspect about my own self, you know. But we were very close. So I called um, Ranger Mesa. He was the one we all looked up to. He was a captain then. He became a, a brigadier general uh, later on before he died. 
I told them, sir, they, I'm to report to Air Force Base. And I asked Odoi why. He wouldn't tell me why. So I got, uh, I think, uh, Lieutenant Kwasi at that time. He also became a general. He was the I.O. And the two of us, we were very tight friends. So I got my driver. I don't think we took troops, more troops, maybe about three or four in mm. the Pinsgo, and we drove to Air Force Base. No, Ranger Mesa was not even there. I just told, spoke to Kwasi, and then we went. We drove there. And when we got to Air Force Base, the atmosphere was so charged, mm. and we realized we were in trouble. We had all these soldiers there with the guns, and uh, they were just hyper, Air Force Base. And Air Force Base was known for, as a base of indiscipline, you know. So we got there, and then I was just told, Lieutenant Kumsen, take the generals to the range. I said, what, what generals? Then I saw General Champong, and I saw General Utrika. Mm. So <laughs> I was a bit confused there, because I was General Champong's guard commander. Oh. And earlier when I had said that it was General Utuka who actually facilitated my joining the military. Oh. And these are two fathers. I said, take them to the range. So immediately it came to my mind that these guys are setting me up. You either don't do it or you get into trouble. Mm. So General Champong just looked at me and wouldn't say anything. General Utuka said, hey boy, what is happening? I haven't been tried. I haven't even been tried. I said, sir, I don't know what is happening. And there was no way I could extricate myself from this thing. So I was told to take them to the range. And I, 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 I have only read about the execution procedure mm. in school. I mean, the military academy. Nobody really teaches you these things. What is the process? I know that you have to take them to the church. And then from the church to the range, when do you put on the hood? When do you do these things? Mm. And that, everything was going in, through my mind. I was given the black hoods. So we sat in the car and I said, so where do I take them first? I said, take them to uh, the Anglican church. There used to be a small church uh, behind Burma camp, okay. the Anglican church. Okay. So all along, I can't even remember exactly those that what General Champo was telling me, but Utuka was the one who was talking more that he's not been tried. Boy, he called me, boy, what is happening? What is going on? You know, I said, I don't know. And there was this convoy behind us, so you couldn't do much. So we went to the church, and the pastor, the chaplain was standing there. So apparently they knew what was happening. Oh. And I had this whole half crazed <laughs> soldiers behind me, so you couldn't even divert. So we went Weren't they to the, in the same car as you. No, 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 no. They were in no, another no. car. I was in the car with the generals. So it was just a few uh, of them. Yeah, and then uh, I think Lieutenant Kwasi was behind me with my car, and then the others were behind us. So we went to the church. It's a small church. They 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 did a small prayer for them, and said we should drive to the range. They they, they knew they were going to that. Oh sure. Oh sure. What did they say? I won't tell you. <laughs> so we drove to the range, and that was the harrowing part. When we got to the range, then I saw my senior, Ranger Mensa. Not knowing that Ranger Mensa too had been ambushed and told to go to the range, and you are the commander of the, uh, the firing squad. The firing squad. <laughs> so we got to the range, and there were so many people there. And the stakes were not ready. They were not digging the stakes. So we got there, and the generals were standing there, watching them prepare the stakes. I said, there was no way. I, I just couldn't believe it. You know, and the old man just told me, boy, Makwala, yeah, sure, who's here, what? You know, that was General Champo. Makwala, yeah, sure, who's here, yes, that. And then Utuka was still shouting. General Champo was just, he was smoking or something. Um, Utuka was still a bit active. I haven't been tried, I haven't been tried. I said, well, I don't know what is happening. And then I decided on the spot the that we are not going to stand there and watch them prepare the stakes because I thought that was torture. So I was going to take them to the military academy gate. There's a quarter guard there. 
So when I tried to do that, I think Odo or someone wanted to prevent me from doing that. So I, quickly, I immediately grabbed the G3 from the G3 the assault rifle mm. from a driver and I pulled the gun on Odo. And I said, if he stood in my way, I'll kill him. I am taking the generals to the quarter guard. When they are finished, I will bring them back and he won't stop standing my way. And when I got the gun, Every, you could hear about 500 gang score. The rangers just shouted, don't fire. He saved the situation because if one shot had gone off, all of us would have killed ourselves. So I just put the generals back into the principal and we drove to the quarter guard and I sat them down until they finished the stakes and we were told to come back. So I drove them back. put the hoods on them and saluted them. But the last time, we think General Champo told me, my father, I shall see you. My papa, you will be a dear 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 I know that you are not part of this. At least he told me that. Mm. How did that make you feel? I don't know what I would, I didn't cry. You were just numb. You, you are just numb, but all the time your senses were around. Those days we were young, and uh, you would always spoil for a fight. But the issue is that we did not have enough troops there to fight these guys. You know, because I kept on eyeing Kwasi, I kept on eyeing. We had eye contact, and each time we got there, you know that the other was there, like, don't try any stupid thing here. <laughs> you know, because it's, you're not going to survive it. So, I think they fired, they, I was there when the, the, the order was given. And then I just drove off. I just drove off straight to, to my father-in-law's house in Burma Villas. My father then was Colonel Chumesi, who became a Major General Chumesi. And just went and he, they had heard, by that time they had heard that the executions were taking place. I just drove and just collapsed into one of the beds in the house and slept. You know. And then I woke up in a nightmare, and he was sitting on top of me. Because I, I, I woke up and I thought I was dying or something. And he had to calm me down. He really had to calm me down. It was well, nightmare. It's, my face is dry just listening to that. Um, Aloga Akatapori um, has joined us via Skype. Zaya Yebo is also with us on the phone lines. Uh, Zakatapoi, thanks for joining us. Um, you've watched the documentary. What's on your mind? Well, it's, uh, it brings back a, a lot of memories, and it's, it's sad. And uh, it's clear that this won't go away until uh, victims uh, come to terms with it. And I think the starting point is for the point is Jerry Rollins is key to this. He has to deliver a proper apology to all the victims and to the nation. Then we can begin to heal. It is not about money. You see, I don't think uh, most of the people who were uh, talking about that. Uh, not being compensated financially. Uh, I don't think that is the issue. Because after all, some of the amounts are paltry. Uh, 500, uh, 1,000, what's that? You know, I wrote to Jerry Rollins a long, long time ago, suggesting to set up an NGO. I offered to come and help run that NGO, you know, which will assist. You see, I was not even thinking of the wider uh, victims. I was thinking of the soldiers that uh, had been put in the process. But as it is, it's something that we can do again. It's, I'm really very sad. I'm very sorry for our part in it. Because at the end of the day, we achieve nothing. nothing substantial for the nation. If it is this sort of system, that was a system that was in place. So 
why interested just make money that is the problem he and his cousin have made money at the expense of everybody else that is the sad thing do you know captain retired kumsin budu kumsin well i remember them very well but you know 40 years old you know and uh, i myself i went through a lot of trauma you know, because I just couldn't understand why I will be put in prison. I thought I would be the right thing. I just could not believe what was happening. And it has become more traumatic for me when I came back and I saw what has actually happened uh, uh, 35 years. Uh, uh, you know, by that time when I came back, it was uh, 35 years old. So I remember. At me very well. Uh, uh, I, did, I don't think. I'm yeah. trying to. Is it? Uh, it was five years. Yes, five years. Yes. It was the. You were the adjunct commander. The adjutant. The, the, you were the, yeah, you yeah. Were the adjutant of I five years. I remember him. Very well. Yeah, he was a young. <laughs> Hello, guy. You were younger than me. <laughs> <laughs> Let, let me let me quickly well, get a word. Yeah, let, yeah, let me get yeah, a word. Thank you very much, now. Mr. Katapori. Yeah. Let me get a quick word from Zaya Yebo because before we move on, you were former PNDC secretary for youth and sports. Uh, Mr. Katapori on the other line believes that the revolution achieved nothing. He's sorry. He says that the system now is worse than what the revolution sought to clean. Do you agree? To some extent, yes, I agree. The state of mm -hmm. Ghana today does not give anyone hope in terms of what we actually achieved after December 31st. But we, there were, but there were, there were some minimal achievements. For instance, in spite, uh, for instance, we were able to conscientize most Ghanaians. We were able to instill to Ghanaians a sense of probity, accountability, and a sense of patriotism. And I think that's what we are hope to do with the People's and Workers' Defense Committee. Of course, we all know what Rawlings did to them, because these institutions, new as they were, were standing in the way of the corrupt elements within, within the Rawlings uh, circle, and they had to get rid of them. Now they claim that they, they got rid of them because the PDCs were causing mayhem. But they were causing mayhem because we could not give them the guidelines as to how to behave. So I think that that was maybe one of the few achievements there. But in terms of the general development of Ghana, I think we achieved nothing, to be honest. If you look at the state of Ghana today, those who came after 1983 when we left have become millionaires. Very poor people are now wallowing in wealth, and that is not what the revolution was about. But one thing that we could do, which has never happened, is Every regime, in every government, sorry, that has been overthrown in Ghana has been investigated. TPP was investigated. The Bouzia government was investigated. We need to investigate that era too. We need to set up a committee that says, look, what really happened? Because when I look, when I watched the the program yesterday, I was so sad that these things happened in Ghana. And to be honest with you, most of us did not even know that these were going on. Now, how do you the 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 National Reconciliation Commission was, was a good start, but it failed to, to unearth a lot of these things because it lacked, a, it lacked a serious political discussion. And I think that nothing prevents us from instituting a committee to, to investigate that period too, because Jerry cannot go around claiming, for instance, that Ghanaians were yearning for blood. Nobody yearned for blood. In fact, when the generals were executed, we were students. But I don't remember anybody going into the street to support the execution. The whole country went silent because we couldn't believe that this had already happened. This could happen in Ghana. So for Jerry's now to look back 40 years on and say Ghanaians were yearning for blood, even Guadijan said the same thing, Ghanaians were yearning for blood. I, I don't remember anyone calling for blood. The Professional Bodies Association, the Ghana Bar Association, the National Union of Ghana Students, the House of Chiefs, all these institutions, I don't remember any of them coming out to say, yes, let's have blood tests. We wanted probity and accountability. 
Was we that achieved? To end. That was all. Mr. Yebo, was that achieved? You are talking about probity, accountability, and patriotism. The last, Afro, the last two rounds of the Afrobarometer saw that 27% of Ghanaian youth want to leave the country. At the moment, less than 50% of the Ghanaian populace, according to the Afrobarometer, want to even vote in the election. Do you think that Ghanaians are more patriotic now? No, I don't think they are. But I, don't forget, I'm talking about something that happened 30, 40 years ago. I don't think Ghanaians are patriotic now. Because if you look at the situation, <laughs> I'm not be surprised if the young people want to leave. So I'm not surprised at all. That I wouldn't say we are more patriotic now than we were before. No, so we're not. So what has the revolution because achieved? Because times have changed. What has the revolution achieved? Pardon? What has the revolution achieved? What has the revolution achieved? Yes. What did it achieve? <laughs> Almost nothing, to be honest. Nothing. Thank you it very has, much. It succeeded in making some individuals very rich. And we know who they are in Ghana today. Who Apart are they? That, so at the individual level, some individuals benefited. Which but people in terms are you of talking about? national development, it achieved nothing. Which it people are you about talking about? Structural adjustment program for 1983. Workers were dismissed. Factories were sold off to individuals, family members, and so on. And we really, uh, the structural adjustment basically destroyed the Ghanaian economy. The little achievements we made under the CPP and under Champon were all decimated. So really, we achieved nothing. Which people are you talking about who made themselves rich? Well, we know, I mean, people like Kojo Chikata, Kwesipoche, and all those who were close to Rollins from 1984 onwards. Those who are close to Rollins, they are all rich now. They are comfortable in, in their lives. You see them around with their big cars and so on. These are the people who, but if you look at the original elements in the 1982 coup, let's say Akatapore himself, or let's say Christian, or let's say the PDCs, the Workers' Defense Committee, the ordinary soldiers who were part of this thing, who thought they were trying to build a better Ghana, they are all destitute. They are all on the streets of Accra. We see them. They are destitute. They achieve nothing. They did not get anything, you know, financial or, or practical out of it. On the other hand, all those who were close to Rawlings are very comfortable, and that's what I meant. So in terms of the national development, we're not able to deal with underdevelopment. We're not able to deal with poverty. We're not able to deal with social exclusion. In fact, we're not able to deal with the, the division in Ghanaian society between the rich and the poor. All I wanted to do was increase access to education, increase access to health, build a better system where Ghanaian women will be able to be treated if, for instance, they, they were pregnant and so on. We're not able to achieve any of that because what did they do? They privatized the health care. Now we have something called national health service. So uh, to, that, to that extent, I cannot really... Zaya, Zaya yeah. Yebo, thank you very much for joining us. Um, He's a former PNDC Secretary for Youth and Sports. Let me thank you as well. Aloga Akatapori, who was a member of the PNDC. Um, have a good morning. Let me also thank Captain Retired Budu Kumsen. Um, thank you very much for sharing um, your experience. And I understand it must have been very difficult. You've never shared that story before. Um, I'm going to take this, give you a 30 seconds to wrap up. And then well, uh, I don't, uh, that was not the main essence for coming. Actually, there's so much that has happened. For instance, I am grateful to God I'm still alive because some people died to save me. Right? My brigade major, Major Nantoma, in the face of death, saved me, knowing very well that he was being taken away. And I'm alive because of Major Nantoma. Because he was a brigade major and I was a brigade. And that was, 30, that was the, I think, on the 8th of January, 82. You know, and. Um, I, I, I reflect, and I'm always grateful that I'm alive, and I'm thankful that I had some good senior officers who would take care of us, right? Who would sacrifice, and they were professional. Look at Odate telling the ADC to surrender, knowing he was going to die, you understand? Major Nantogma telling them that Kumsin is not there. I was standing there, you know, knowing very well that he was going to die the next 15 minutes or so, you understand? So. But then it's make me reflective. I'm not bitter. I'm just disdainful. I'm disdainful of those guys 
who, who, who hid or pretended and then later on prancing around as if they are the tough guys in town and these things. I'm not looking for vengeance or anything. But then I'm, I, I want us to really analyze mm. why were all these coups successful. In my opinion, it's so painful. These coups should not have succeeded if other officers had been interventionists. My, mm. my former commanding officer, Ken Oting, said it in the documentary. He said yeah. Odate died because his colleagues refused to come out and behave as soldiers to fight. They hid. They hid. Or they refused to act. All these coups succeeded because we had other officers and commanders who would not behave as officers and commanders. So a few people were left with the ball all the time. It's not like I liked fighting. I always found myself in the wrong place at the wrong time or the right place at the right time, and the fights kept on coming. At the end of the day, I had one fight too much, and it cost me 20 years in exile. 20 years. You know what sustained me? I have a little prayer book here, and I deliberately brought it. That's a prayer book my mother gave me. And I keep this prayer book. And there's one prayer she always made me read. And that is, I, I almost knew it off the top of my head. And it always helped me. And it kept, it made me not to be bitter. If you would spare me. It says, that's a prayer for fortitude. It said, oh God, give me strength to live another day. Let me not turn coward before its difficulties or prove recreant to its duties. Let me not lose faith in my fellow men. Keep me sweet and sound of heart in, in spite of ingratitude, treachery, or meanness. Preserve me from minding little things mm. or giving them, so I'm not bitter. Mm. So help me to keep my heart clean and to live so honestly and fearlessly that no outward failure can dishearten me or take away the joy of conscious integrity. Mm. Open wide the eyes of my soul that I may see good in all things. Grant me these days some new vision of thy truth. Inspire me with a spirit of joy and gladness and make me the cup of strength to suffering souls because we are suffering. That's and then in the name of the strong believer, these are the things that kept me going. I was chased as a common thief in Lome. Why? Because I was a refugee. I had to run into the sea to save myself in the night. I had to beg to eat on the streets of Lome. You understand? But look at what God has done. That's why I'm not bitter. But we should get to the bottom of this thing. Those who cause Captain. atrocities should be on earth and prosecuted and pardoned if possible. Captain, thank you very much. Um, this conversation is not over. Uh, we have a repeat of this documentary right after the AM show. Stay tuned in for that if you missed it last night. My name is Daniel Dazin. Up next is Showbiz News with Becky.